Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK, a special focus on the biggest challenges facing the British government, the economy, financial services, and, of course, markets. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, last week, we asked what's next for the UK housing market. This week, we look at the outlook for the UK economy and for the city of London and the big economic issues facing the government when Parliament returns from summer recess. And later in the show, we'll also be joined by Andy Briggs. He's the chief executive of Phoenix Group, one of the pension providers that has signed up to a pact to boost their investment in UK growth companies. Now, here with me to discuss all of this are Bloomberg, Bloomberg UK City Editor uh, Catherine Griffiths, also our Senior UK Economist Stan Hansen from our team at Bloomberg Economics. Thank you both for joining us. I love days like today because we have a bit of news, but actually we really want to look towards the next six months and what you're expecting through all of your research and, and speaking to, to a lot of the newsmakers. Catherine, the City of London, I feel like, is at a juncture, right, because of what we've lived through over the last 12 months. I mean, let's remember it's, it's been less than 12 months ago that, that we had that pension debacle, that Liz Truss was in charge, that roiled the markets. Like, what are you most looking forward to in the next six months? So I think, um, although from a journalistic point of view, the Liz Truss era was ex extremely exciting, um, probably looking forward to less drama on the markets front. Um, I think people in the City of London spent lots and lots of time really trying to get on board with kind of government ideas on pension reform and other sorts of City of London reform in the first half of this year. They've all gone off to have their very nice holidays on their boats and this, that and the other. And we'll probably come back hard in the autumn. We'll have the autumn statement from the Chancellor. And, and actually, it's only a year in December. It's when the government came up with its Edinburgh reform. So all sorts of ideas ranging from how to make banking more competitive, how to make the prospectus regime better, Actually, time is ticking on, and some of these kind of ideas have not converted into concrete plans yet. But even if these ideas, you know, become plans, do they actually make a meaningful difference to the city of London, or do they just look at the economy, listen, and you know, read what Dan Hansen writes, and say, actually, maybe I go elsewhere? Yeah, I think that's the big, the big challenge, and I think that people genuinely just don't know. The jury's out. I think there's certainly a sense that individual ideas don't make much difference. Perhaps if they can get the package, it could make a difference. But yeah, I think the real hope is that certainly in terms of the kind of macroeconomic trends, things start to look better, but also maybe just some sort of stories. So right. the odd big company that needs to kind of say, yes, we're going to float okay. in London. Uh, would that make a big difference? I mean, is there anyone on the horizon who would like, who would, you know, come to the UK? Um, so I don't think so, not don't obviously. Have anything. I think at least companies stopping saying they're going to move from the UK to the US would be a positive sign. Okay, so I, I love Dan Hansen's piece. Every time there's a new research by Dan Hansen, the newsroom is like, oh, we're, we're going to be in a recession. Oh, we're not. Wait. And then every time I'm also in a press conference, um, Governor Bailey always gets a hard time. And people are saying, like, well, the markets weren't expecting this. He says, well, Bloomberg Economist was expecting this. So, Dan, congratulations to you and the team for, for getting it, you know, more right, I guess, th than most. Are we at a juncture for the UK economy? Again, the Bank of England doesn't have a, a great track record so far. Yeah. Um, can they make or break the economy right now? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the key question going into the second half of the year. So we dodged, if you like, the energy price-driven recession. So the first six months of this year it was all about we're potentially going to be in a recession because of this rise in energy prices. The UK economy has dodged that, and that's great news. Obviously, the flip side of that is that inflation has been much more stubborn. So that's put yeah. the Bank of England centre stage, and now we've got rates up at 5.25, possibly going a little bit higher. So I think, for me at least, in the second half of the year, the question is, will this tip the economy into a recession or will there just be this sort of, if you like, this immaculate disinflation, this soft landing? I'm actually in the that first... That feels like wishful thinking. Well, that, well, exactly. I mean, you said it yourself. And so, and that's, you know, that, it's that combination of the economy being essentially stagnating for a year Yep. The Bank of England erring on the side of wanting to do a little bit more rather than a little bit less to make sure inflation comes down. So you mix those two things together and it's not hard to see a world where you do get some quarters of negative, con uh, negative GDP growth. So it's, in our forecast, it's a mild recession. It's not sort of 90s, yeah. it's not the 80s, certainly not the financial crisis. But nonetheless, we do see some weakness going into 2024. And then the language actually of Governor Bailey has changed, right? First of all, I, I thought he was much more confident uh, he felt m much more at ease with what he was saying uh -huh. in the last press conference. And I don't know whether it's because he does see a turning point. Yeah. But also they seem to be suggesting that we're, we're nearly there. So you know, these interest rates could stay higher for much longer, but there's not much more to go. I think that's a really 
good point about his confidence in it. The interesting thing about that, of course, is it stems from one data point, and we've had a lot of data surprises to the upside. So I think the most important thing he said, though, was about, I think it was the term he used, was the last mile. So it's not going to be hard, I say, to get inflation down. <laughs> Famous to, last words. <laughs> to, you know, three, maybe four yeah. percent. It's that getting that down from four or three down to two. That's the hard bit. And that's actually where policy needs to do the work. And that goes to his point about rates staying higher for longer. That's why he wants rates to stay higher for longer, because it's to press the economy. And then crucially, the crucial point here is the labor market, loosening the labor market. Because until you do that, you just got no hope of bringing inflation back to target. We've got private sector wage growth near 8% in the UK. It's just not consistent with 2% inflation. But he's expecting that, I think, to, to go to 6%, right? By he is, by, by the end of the year. And yes, how do you grow the economy? I mean, this is like the, the gazillion trillion dollar question. Do, do we have a blueprint? Do you have a blueprint in mind of how this economy will fare over the next two to three years? So over the next, as I say, in, in the near term, we are expecting quite significant weakness. I mean, I think the broader point here is around supply capacity in the UK economy and that, that essentially tells you how fast it can grow in the medium term no. without stoking inflation. And I think the government has a role to play here around investment in particular um, because it's not just about government investment and boosting that up to levels that will deliver a return. It's that that has spillovers to the private sector of course. Now at the moment of course with interest rates high you might argue there's not a good rate of return on these investment projects mm. but for me at least I think longer term and Whoever the new government is after the next election, investment is a really key part of it because in the UK we have just lagged for yeah. so long on that front, not only on the government side but also on the business investment side. And that was some part of that was to do with Brexit. But the hope is that in time, if we can get that side of the economy going, we can't just be a consumer spending led economy. We need to focus on investment and getting that going, and that will lift hopefully the supply capacity of the economy. But in this, what's the role of the City of London? Again, you know, we're talking about finance. Um, and this was a huge part of the composition of GDP that they've kind of forgotten about for the last couple of years, focusing on manufacturing on other parts of the economy. Can, can the city c come back with enough love? Yeah, um, I mean, the city wants to come back and um, I think quite unusually com compared to sort of the recent history with Brexit and things, it really kind of got on the front foot yeah. to try and come up with some of these ideas for the reforms around pensions and things, which yeah. is such a huge wall of money that can be kind of deployed potentially into other areas. Um, but I suppose, I suppose the interesting thing perhaps is that, you know, the government is in a tight spot financially. And so on the one hand, it wants to kind of encourage investment by pri the private sector and indeed foreign investors. But, you know, how does it look from a kind of political point of view if you start giving out incentives, for example, and you've got people kind of around the country who are struggling and, and you've really got this real problem with the regions and a lack of levelling up? Um, Catherine, when you look at the relationship between Labour and a lot of business leaders, I mean, it's very clear that Labour want to have meetings with them, be seen as business friendly. Is that, what is the city's view on this? Again, is it too early days? Because we don't really know what Labour's policies are in, yeah. in the fine print. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, they definitely want to have lots of meetings and are having lots of meetings. And I think they certainly, people are saying they feel... Um, they've got confidence in Rachel Reeves. They think she's a serious person as the shadow chancellor um, and other people around Keir Starmer. Certainly, we speak to people, entrepreneurs, who are saying that they are investing now in the UK because they expect Labour to win the next election and that they, they say that they are serious people. That's not everyone's point of view, of course. There are people who think, you know, Rishi Sunak is a, is a serious business person, but who feel disappointed, perhaps, by some of the kind of right-leaning policies which they think are not actually particularly business-friendly. Dan, is, it, is there a part of the economy that actually they can lean on? I don't know whether it's AI, whether it's green, but again, is there a sector that would benefit the UK more quickly th than others if there was the right investments from abroad? Well, I think the, your point about on the green side, I think that's, that's certainly something. And like, the interesting thing about what Labour have done, of course, is they've scaled back a little bit their commitment there and they've been a little bit less, they want to be a little bit less aggressive with how quickly they ramp up the investment in the green side of the economy. And I think it goes to Catherine's point about Labour generally being perceived as a serious um, government in waiting because, and it goes back, we were just talking about it off air there, but nearly a year ago, what happened with Liz Truss? What markets will do if you don't have a credible plan? So that's made the Labour Party really think about what they're going to do and whether they, they can present something that 
is credible for the City of London, but also credible for the economy generally. And I think there is, there is something in it that they've got, and that it is a, it is a serious plan. So, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens with the election. But I think, you know, the focus on the green side of the economy, that's, that's got to be something that is taken seriously going forward, because we all know this is, this is something that is not going away. It's an issue that's not going away. All right, thank you both for joining us. Dan Hansen, they're a senior UK economist at Bloomberg Economics, and Catherine Griffiths, our Bloomberg UK City Editor. Now, coming up, that's the view of some of the experts here at Bloomberg. After the break, we'll ask some of the same questions to Andy Briggs, chief executive of one of the UK pension providers who signed up to the government's mansion house reforms. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. season is here. Another crazy busy week. There's still a lot of uncertainty. Market knows that there's bad things coming. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. A slew of earnings. Some breaking earnings. What did we learn from earnings? I mean, a lot of them beat. Some of them got slammed. With exclusive expert analysis. This is a growth story. Advertisers are cooling back. It certainly will be a headwind. Good revenue growth across the globe. A record year. I haven't seen it was odd like that since a decade. We're stunning still. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the UK's Conservative Party is under electoral pressure over the cost of living crisis, poor economic growth, and of course, a raft of corporate criticism. One of Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's key responses has been the Mansion House Compact, an agreement for nine major pension providers to boost their investment in growth companies. Well, my next guest is one of the signatories to that agreement. He is Andy Briggs. He's chief executive of Phoenix Group. Andy, thank you so much for coming on. I know we've been trying to make this interview work for quite some time. First of all, when you look at the government, when you look at the City of London and its place for the future growth of this country, are you optimistic that it will get the job done? Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic that the, the city and the pension sector particularly has a really key role to play. So the UK pension sector has over three trillion of assets we're investing on behalf of our customers. At Phoenix Group, we're the UK's largest long-term savings and retirement business. We have 270 billion of our assets that we're investing on behalf of our 12 million customers. So we can do real good to make our customers get better outcomes and uh, invest that money in a way that's beneficial to the broader economy. And the, the, the problem with growth companies is that they can do well. Or, or they can't do well depending on when you enter because you don't exactly know the viability of it. So it's scalability, what the U.S. is very good at, and uh, the Europeans are less good at. Yeah, so, so I think what's then important, if you take an individual pension customer, what we're talking about in the Mansion House Compact is that 5% of their total assets will be invested in some of these private equity companies, some of these uh, uh, growth opportunities. What's really important then is that there's a very broad range of investments across a very broad range of sectors and multiple vintages so that individual investments can do really well or poorly, but the customers will have a very, very broad range averaging across a, a, a a wide range of investments. I mean, what do you think that, you know, the government needs to do now to attract more foreign direct investment? I don't know whether it's regulation, whether it's, it's literally just, just calling some of the big investors and say, come to the UK or something else. Yeah, so there's a whole package of reforms here, but with the Mansion House Compact, let's sort of break this down a bit. So the three trillion pensions uh, uh, savings in the UK uh, market is the second largest globally. Yeah. Only 9% of that is invested into what we would call productive assets, so things like private equity, private debt. Um, and, and that 9% compares to 23% in the other largest pensions nations globally. Yeah. But does it need to come into real money? And, and I know you're also your, your former chairman, right, is, is Lord Mayor of London, and he's behind this. Are, are, is it quick enough? Do you, do you actually need to now, does the government need to do more to actually see the money going to the right places? So, so I, I think we've made a lot of progress on momentum and getting things moving this year, but I think we really do have to focus on the outcomes and to see that money flowing. Because if, if you look from a customer point of view, the impact of, of, of us having far less invested in these productive assets... So over the last 10 years, UK defined contribution savers have had a real return of 4% per annum over the last decade. Um, their Australian and Canadian counterparts have had 52 
to 5.5 percent so they're basically if it carries on as it is that the Canadians and Australians are going to have a third higher retirement income than UK yeah. customers so it's urgent for our customers that we give them the opportunity to benefit this yeah. but alongside that in the UK we have um, many of the best universities globally in terms of innovation and startups but what happens is they don't get funded at, from, from the UK after that initial early startup phase so the UK economy is missing out on the growth right. opportunities as a result. But I mean, we're the city of London there's so much money is it because money is going elsewhere or it's not attractive enough has it not been attractive enough in the past for them to, to stay in the UK and actually link up to some of these projects? So, so I, I would say that, that a, lot, a lot of the issue is is a combination of regulation and culture so the pension sector in the UK has, has been really focused on the charges yeah. that, char that customers get charged which is obviously very important but what is most important is the overall outcome I've already illustrated mm -hmm. that the outcome in Australia and Canada yes. is, is better for consumers so I think there's a cultural element and there's a regulation element the both of those are looking to be ad addressed by this I, I think that the real shame is that that we have these fantastic universities fantastic startups that could drive really positive economic growth for, for the country as a whole It'd create more employment better paid right. work all, all, all those opportunities and we're not leveraging those it tends to be overseas capital that invests but very often then then loses interest right. and so the businesses don't right. get the chance to scale and when you speak to to big US investors there's a bit of an idea of like look I'm looking at the headlines it seems like a mess whether it be the UK or Europe maybe I want to put my money elsewhere does the city of London need, need a big win a, a big IPO something big in the pipeline that makes global headlines to, to restore confidence so, so I, I think it's important that 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 the UK has a, a a decent period of, of, of steady progression, if you right. like. So I think you know, when I talk to overseas investors in terms of investing in Phoenix Group, that they will talk about things yeah. like Brexit, they will talk about um, you know, last September and the market turbulence then, yeah. and, and that has had an impact on confidence in the yeah. city of London. I think the most important thing is a period of stability, which I think we, we are starting to see. Have you seen the city of London change since you started? You, you've been working in the city of London for, Th 30 for a years. Wee while. I started when I was 10. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, it, there's, there's been a lot of changes, but I, I do think we're on the cusp of a real opportunity here. Um, and we've also got the Solvency 2 reforms, which we we should yeah. touch on as well another part of the reform package where we've got we an only do solvency on Tuesdays no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I think there's a real opportunity um, uh, to, to, to to generate better returns yeah. for our customers and at the same time support the broader economy sustainability yeah. and climate change is another area where there's an all yes. we're doing a lot already but there's an awful lot more we can do and uh, very quickly do you think the UK needs to again you know brand itself either the sustainability economy like green bonds or the AI economies again is that easier for investors to put money if you know exactly what you're you're aiming for so our, our primary focus is how do we get our customers money generating yeah. better returns for them and investing in the UK economy and that's the, that's the package of reforms we've been focused on. Okay, uh, Phoenix Group Chief Executive Andy Briggs stays with us. Uh, we'll also talk of course about productivity and employment in the UK. Now be sure to subscribe to Bloomberg's In the City podcast that I host alongside David Merritt on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop every Thursday and today we actually focus on the Bank of England. We have an expert panel and they disagree so it's a great listen. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg UK. Now let's continue the conversation with Phoenix Group Chief Executive Andy Briggs. Andy, thank you so much, first of all, for sticking around. Now you've done immense work, actually, to looking at labor shortage, but of the older population. It's difficult to, to measure, to model, like, what, you know, how do you fix this? Yeah, so, so the, the, the core opportunity here is um, research from our think tank, Phoenix Insights, says only one in seven people in the UK are saving enough for a decent standard of living in retirement. So one of the best things that people can do if they want to, to have a better retirement, is to work for longer. And yet we also know that if the over 50s fall out of work, they're least likely to get back into work. So what, what's really important here is, is, is giving the opportunity for more over 50 to get back into work. And there are three key things we, we need to do. Businesses need to focus more on how they retain their over 50s. So for example, things like caring 
caring policies, uh, flexible working, a lot of over 50s have caring responsibilities. Secondly, businesses need to focus on where they recruit uh, from because an awful lot of businesses recruit where they've always recruited. If you've always recruited school leavers, you're not going to get any, any over 50s. Think about the adverts that you do. And then the, the final element is around retraining. So, so many training packages are focused on younger ages. Uh, people in their 50s have a whole host of uh, you know, reusable, uh, transferable skills. And, and, and let's, let's, let's get, get those over 50s the opportunities to train into other areas, new careers, new opportunities. And, and we're seeing schemes actually pop, you know, up certainly at the private level. Is there a worry that if you don't fix the NHS, you're never really going to fix the underlying problems that people are still waiting for operations as they get older and so can't get back to the workforce? So, so that, that's an element, but it's, it's a relatively small element in terms of, of, of people falling out of work and not getting back into work as a result of ill health. So, so yeah, right. that, 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 great if we can fix that, but there's a whole host of stuff we can do outside of that. Uh, there, there's a labour shortage in the UK. How much would that help if you got you know 30% of, I guess, the older population that dropped out back into work. Yeah, it will make a massive difference because ultimately we got pretty close to full employment in the UK. So back to what we were talking about before, trying to drive economic growth. You know, we need people to do jobs to drive the economic growth. And so getting over 50s, many of whom I say, won't be saving enough for a decent standard of living in retirement, giving them the opportunity to get back into work, potentially different work, different areas, potentially flexible working, I think would make a massive difference to the broader economy. OK, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Phoenix Group Chief Executive there, Andy Briggs. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition is up next with Credit Group in New York, Danny Berger in London. We'll continue watching, of course, what's happening with CPI in the U.S., a couple of other stories that we need to keep an eye on, not only CPI, but everything that's going on with house prices. Now, we had a great U.K. program last week looking at um, what's going on exactly in house prices, and the U.S. housing market is now seem to be seeing demand and prices slump. This is according to a think tank that's looking at surveys. It's actually according to Rick. So the figures adding to evidence that the housing market is actually weakening in the UK. We'll have plenty more on that throughout the day. And this is Bloomberg.